Ready for the word? Yeah, right. Or more of the word. Uh, I didn't get the, the uh, title changed up there. The computer wasn't, wasn't working quite right for me. But what I want to talk about is, uh, a li- it's a little bit of a continuation of last week when uh, I talked about the truth about discipleship. And I want to really get into today uh, about what does love look like. Because, uh, let's see, do I have John? Th- yeah, uh, yeah, that's good. We're still kind of on that topic. John 13, 1. I know that we looked at this one last week. Uh, as the, the beginning of that message, uh, when we're talking about what, it, what discipleship looked like under Jesus, right? And, the, and people's idea that discipleship, uh, especially in a religious context, often in a church context, discipleship has the connotation of, you know, being very regimented and very rigid and kind of, you know, discipline and, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. And is that what it looked like under Jesus? Well, not exactly. It actually looked like these guys spending a whole lot of time together and Jesus radically changing their lives and making them become amazing. <laughs> That's what it really looked like. And there's this um, one verse in uh, especially John 13, 1, it said, Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And I think that is a definitive statement of what discipleship looked like under Jesus. Right? He, he found these guys, he recruited these guys, regular guys, fishermen and tax collectors, not the religious leaders of the day, right? Not the, not the most respected of society at all. He just found these regular guys, just guys, right? And he said, follow me, right? And then he started loving them. And he says he loved them all the way to the end. He loved them every day, loved them every week, loved them every month, kept loving them and radically transforming them. And uh, that's what discipleship looked, under, looked like under Jesus. And there's more to that, of course. You know, he, uh, he made them become uh, world leaders, um, uh, agents of change. He made them become amazing. He poured into them and equipped them in amazing ways. Um, that's what his discipleship looked like. But I, I want to uh, kind of go into more detail today and, and really say more, uh, what does love look like? You know, if, if his discipleship was love, uh, what does it look like specifically? Um, and one of the things I think that, uh, one of the points I want to make, first of all, is that uh, love, as, as it's expressed and taught in the Bible, love is proactive and it's goal-oriented. And I want you to absorb that for just a second. You know what proactive means, right? Love is, proactive means it's something you do strategically, you do it on purpose, you do it with decision, you do it with absolutely positive about what you're trying to accomplish and what you're, you know, what you're trying to go for here. Proactive is very purposeful. Very, very, pro- and so love is proactive. There's something you're trying to accomplish. Right? I really, be- really believe that, and uh, and it's also goal oriented. Maybe it's a similar, similar word, but but Jesus' love was goal oriented. What's he trying to do with these guys when he says, "I'm going to love these guys. I'm going to love them all the way to the end," and he's got radical transformation in mind, doesn't he? It's not just, "Hey, let's all get along and have a nice, peaceful time." It's like he's got this goal. He's got the end in mind from the beginning. This fisherman and this tax collector and these other fishermen and, you know, this political zealot and, he's, you know, all these different guys he recruited said, you guys, a few years from now, you're going to be so amazing. <laughs> you're going to be rocking the world right, because of this love. And so it's very proactive and very goal-oriented. Uh, that's what God is trying to do with all of us. And... Uh, so I, I, I want to make that point about love. It's not just this passive kind of, you know, nice feeling. It's very goal-oriented. There's something we're trying to accomplish here, right? So he looks at that fisherman and says, three and a half years from now, you're going to be a leader. You're going to be rocking the place, right? People are going to listen to you and go, whoa, all right? That's what I'm going to accomplish here. And what does that have to do with all of us? First of all, we're all disciples, right? If we've said yes to Jesus, right, we're disciples. But then also, uh, I really, really believe that all the principles involved in discipleship also translate into family. So if you're raising kids, they're disciples. So again, please understand my, what, what disciple means according to the Bible. It's not this very regimented kind of program where you're going to make them little religious clones. What discipleship means according to Jesus is radically loving them and making them amazing. So when you're raising kids, does that, if you're making disciples, aren't you radically loving them and trying to make them amazing? Right? So they grow up and they're just, being, they're just going to rock the place. These kids are, that you're raised, they're going to be amazing. And people go, whoa, look at those kids, right? Wow. What do they got? They got something, don't they? And you got, start out with that goal. It's proactive and it's goal-oriented. If you're raising kids, if you're raising grandkids, uh, can you do that for your, for your husband or wife? Yes, absolutely, right? You can do that for your friends and people you minister to and people you hang around with. Absolutely. Love is proactive and goal-oriented, right? Wants, wants to bring 
a real change. Uh, and, it's, and it's genuinely for the good of the other person, not just for me, right? I'm not raising kids just so I look good. I, want, I don't want my kids to shame me, right? I, don't want, I want people to think I'm a great person because of my kids. No, that's, what it is. that's not what it is at all. I'm raising the kids with proactive love because I want that child, that young man, young woman, to grow up and be genuinely amazing for their own good, for their own sake. Not for mine, right? I want it for their good so that they're just absolutely rocking and amazing, right? And they continue that on, right? And love is not really based on self-interest and ego and anything else. It's truly, genuinely based on the good of the other person. Uh, Romans 13, there's a couple of verses, 9 and 10, I wanted to include in this thought because... uh, It's kind of pulling from the Old Testament, right? The idea of the Ten Commandments um, and uh, how love is defined. He says, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all, excuse me, all are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Excuse me. And verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And when you, when you read this passage, right, you could really kind of get the idea that, again, love simply is defined by don't hurt anybody, right? If you don't hurt nobody, that's love. That's not love. That's just the bare minimum, right? That's just saying, staying out of the, t- the negative territory here. The, the Old Testament laws were about don't hurt, don't steal, don't kill, don't betray, don't lie, right? They were about don't hurt people, right? They weren't really about getting into proactive love, real love, right? Jesus came and showed us what that was, right? So is, you know, he's saying that the commandments are the fulfillment of the law in the sense, yeah, that if, you're, if you walk in love, you won't hurt anybody, yes. But is it, is it good enough? Does it, does it demonstrate love to just passively not hurt people? I just mind my own business. I don't hurt nobody. Is that really love? No, it's really not. It's actually, right, that's just getting by, right? That's, um, what, is, what does love actually do? It's what Jesus did with those 12 guys, right? You follow me. I'm going to purposely, proactively love, pour love into you, right, until a few years from now. You're going to be amazing. That's what love is, right? I'm just, it's not just that I'm not going to hurt you, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour into you. I've got a goal. I've got a product in mind here, and it's going to be you, right? Um, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, verse 1 also, says, Now concerning things offered to idols, Paul, Paul writing about this in Corinthians, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. But what does love do? <laughs> yeah, love edifies. I, I love this little verse here. Actually, if you, if you uh, ask the question, what does love look like? And I did. And then just get a basic, you know, Bible concordance or uh, computer or whatever, you know, just a little computer search and find, go through the Bible and look for the place where it talks about love, right? And, uh, and just begin to accumulate the ideas, what does love look like? It's, it's a pretty simple thing to do. And there's, you, you'd get about several dozen uh, ideas very, very quickly about what love looks like. This is one. Knowledge puffs up, but love always does what? <laughs> And if I, again, it's not that love just doesn't hurt you. I'm just, if I love you, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to betray you. No, that's not it. Love will edify you. Real love, edify means build you up, right? I want to encourage you. I want to strengthen you. I want to help you become more than you are now. I want to become, help you become an amazing person who's right, going to go farther and do more and be better than you've ever been before. That's what love does. And he's contrasting the idea of knowledge because, and he's saying, actually, you know, we all have knowledge. And what he's referring to is the fact that even in the church there, in that debate about, you know, idols at the time, some people were content with the fact that they were right. I'm right. Uh, My opinion's right. I understand this, and I'm right, and you're wrong. And that's it. That's how this thing ends. I'm right, and you're wrong. And Paul said, that's not love. Being right is never enough. Love edifies. How about that person's heart? How about that person's soul? How about right, in the midst of this debate over what's right and what's wrong, how about you actually care about how this person, about their heart, right, and what they're going through and the kind of person they're going to become and the kind of influence you're going to have on them right this moment, right? That's what love does. Love edifies. It's never concerned with whether I'm right or wrong or, uh, or more particularly whether I'm right and you're wrong, right? It's always about how can I build up this person? How can I help this person grow and become... Uh, more amazing because of uh, the love of God. 
So if you get that one idea, just, just for starters, really accomplish something already, right? Love is proactive, love is goal-oriented. Right? It is not passive, it's not just feel good, be nice. It absolutely is, is a productive thing. Um, then uh, also in John 13, uh, 23, we read this last week also and, <laughs> and several times recently uh, because it's, it's that, that's during, again, that Last Supper when um, Jesus is gathered with the, his 12, his guys, and they're eating dinner, the Passover dinner, and talking. And, and uh, this passage says there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now we know that's who. That's John, of course. And uh, but, but I want to look at this more in a symbolic way right now, because what does love look like? If we're going to define love, love looks like pursuing a heart-to-heart connection, right? And love looks like pursuing and increasing a heart-to-heart connection. Love isn't just being nice to somebody. You can be nice to somebody and not, not, in, not like them at all. Right? You can be nice to somebody and not be able to tolerate them. <laughs> you know, not, not want to spend a moment more with them, right? But I can still be nice. Right? Is that love? No, that's not love. That might be good manners. <laughs> you know, but, but real love is you're, you're actively wanting to get into their heart somehow, right? And connect with their heart, your heart and their heart, and make the connection that's real, right? Because how many, how many, how many of you know it's, it's possible to go through our days and our weeks here in, surrounded by millions of people in our city, right? It's possible to go through our days and feel very lonely, isn't it? Absolutely. It's possible to be married and feel lonely, it's possible to, possible to be part of a family and feel lonely. It's possible to be part of a church and feel lonely. Right? It's possible to be surrounded by neighbors and feel lonely. What's that about? Because it, you're, it's the, solu- the, the solution to loneliness is not being around people necessarily. The solution to loneliness is heart-to-heart connection. Feeling there's somebody that connects with my heart, somebody that opens their heart and cares about my heart, and we connect, we talk, we're, we're open, there's... Right? Because we all have that hidden place inside, right? What you see on me, what I see in you, you see the face, you see the eyes, the hair, the body, whatever. You can see expressions, and it's all nice, it's all good. Are you really seeing the person's heart? No, not really, not really. <laughs> and a lot of our interaction is surface. And, but you, we all know there's a, there's a secret place on the inside of us that's, that's me. That's really me inside. What do I feel, and what do I think, and what do I want, and who am I really down inside of there, right? And does anybody care about that person? Right? And that's the heart, really. And so uh, love really looks like purposely trying to connect with that heart. What do you really think? What do you really feel? What do you really want? What are you afraid of? What are you hoping for? What do you need? Right? What, are your, what delights you? Right? right? And when you connect with somebody's heart and you purposely begin to do that, right, that's what love looks like. Again, you know, can you do that with everybody? No, but, but you can do it with somebody, right? You can do it with, especially with the, your, your, your spouse, your family members, uh, and then with some friends, and you can, you know, that's what love looks like. And the reason I read this verse is because I'm seeing this, in this moment, I'm seeing this symbolically. John is laying on Jesus' chest, and he's listening to his heartbeat, like his head is there. And that's what love looks like, is listening to somebody's heartbeat. What do you think? What do you feel? What do you need? What delights you? What scares you? What are your hopes, right? What are you thinking right now? What are you feeling right now? Yeah, that's what love looks like. Um, <clears throat> First John 4.19. In, in the idea of love pursues heart-to-heart connection, um, one of my favorite verses ever, 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 right there, First John 4, 19. Uh, here's what love looks like. Love goes first. Love makes the first move. Amen? Right. And that's, yeah, it's a, we, love, we love him, we love God because he first loved us. Jesus came and modeled that, right? He came and be, t- t- grabbed those guys, right, and says, you, fisherman, you, right? Uh, tax collector, you, I'm going to love you. Right? Follow me, come on, I'm going to love you. And he made the first move. He poured love into them. He, love goes first, right? Uh, love isn't afraid of rejection. 
Love will risk rejection, and sometimes you, you experience rejection if you love, don't you? Love, yeah, rejection is still always possible. But love's not really afraid of rejection. Uh, it's not pleasant, nobody likes it, and we don't want it. But if you love, you're willing to take that risk. Amen? And if you're rejected, you know what? It's not even the most devastating thing in the world. If your heart is filled with the love of God, right? Love is sourced in God. We know that. Right? Um, when we get, people get involved in relationships, oftentimes what people are looking for is love. Right? Who's going to make me feel loved? Are you going to make me feel loved? Are you the solution to my empty heart? Right? And they generally are not <laughs> because we're all broken to some degree and we all have emptiness to some degree. And the only, right, we know that the only true, pure source of, of love, absolutely unfail, unfailing love, is God. Right? And so when you open your heart and, and really find God as your love source, right, then again, you know, you become one of those people who gives love rather than the person who's always searching for somebody else to love you. And, and so, you know, if somebody rejects you, guess what? It's not devastating. It's not terrible. Right? You keep going, right? You keep, right? You fill your heart with God's love, you keep going. But love goes first. Love makes the first move. That's what God did. He modeled that for us. Uh, and Luke 6.32 also, what does love look like? Uh, Jesus said this cool little thing, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Um, and and the, the point I want to make on this one is, uh, what does love look like? Love doesn't keep score. <laughs> Love doesn't keep score. But we tend to do that, right? We tend to say, oh, I love you this much, so you have to love me this much back. Or you hurt me this much, so I'm going to hurt you that much back. Right? And we, we can kind of keep a running score a lot of times, you know, with, with people. And, uh, okay, I, and, and basically Jesus is saying, no, I want you to be so radically filled with love that you can love people who hate you, right? You don't have to keep score at all. You can just love them, you know? And, uh, and how does that translate into our lives, into our families, into our friends? It just looks like love doesn't keep score. That's all, right? Um, we, we, we love because God is our source of love. We love because love is proactive and love is goal-oriented. As I love you, my goal is, is to see you become amazing, right? to see you be changed and transformed and healed and filled and become amazing. And, and it's not about keeping score. It's not about how much you owe me or if you've hurt me, now we have to get even. Love just doesn't keep score. Jeremiah 31.3 God said uh, this to Israel and to us. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And so what else does love look like? Love pursues. Right? And that's what God's saying he did here. I've loved you with an everlasting love. And, of course, he loved us from eternity. Right? Before we existed, he knew, that he knew we would exist. He knew we'd be born. He knew what we'd look like. He knew what gifts and callings he was putting, what destiny he was putting in our hearts. And he said, I'm going to pursue you. When you're born and you start growing up, I'm going to chase after you. Somehow I'm going to send people to talk to you. I'm going right, to pour my spirit on you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue you. I'm going to draw you. Right? Love, again, it's, it's much like 1 John 4, 19. Love uh, makes the first move. Love goes first. God and, and love pursues. Hmm. So again, if you're motivated by fear of rejection, uh, you're not going to be doing a lot of pursuing, are you, of other people, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm just busy trying to not get hurt, right? I'm just busy trying to not get wounded in some way. But uh, you get healed, you get, God, you get filled with God's love, and you become a pursuer. You become a pursuer of, well, again, how does this apply? You become a pursuer of, of your children or grandchildren. You pursue them. Well, I pursue, they're just my child. They're my grandchild. I don't have to pursue them. Yes, you do. You absolutely do. Pursue their heart. Because what does love look like again? It looks like making a connection, right? A heart-to-heart -heart connection. What does love look like with your spouse, husband, or wife? It looks like pursuing. I don't have to pursue them. We got married. There's a certificate on the wall or whatever, right? Yes, you do. You have to pursue them because it's still about heart-to-heart -heart connection. It's about increasing. We already have a good connection. Go deeper, right? Go deep. It's about pursuing a heart-to-heart -heart connection. And so that means pursuing your children, for a heart-to-heart -heart connection. It means pursuing your spouse. It means pursuing your friends. It means pursuing the stranger that God is saying, I want you to share Jesus with this person, right? I want you to, this person needs Jesus. Could you become their friend? Could you pursue them for me, right? And then make a heart-to-heart -heart connection and then share Jesus with them, 
right? That's what love looks like. It looks like pursuing. It's goal-oriented. It's proactive. Uh, John 3.16. Anybody heard that one? <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting. So God so loved in this case that he gave. Love looks like giving, doesn't it? Of course. Um, and it means giving freely. That means, again, we don't keep score. Okay? God's not keeping score. He just freely keeps giving, freely keeps loving. Uh, another way to describe that is love makes deposits. If you've been with me a long time, you know that, you know that uh, principle. But if you're fairly new, you may not have heard it. The, uh, somebody told me a long, long time ago about the principle of the emotional bank account, which is, right, just like in the bank, right, we all have, uh, in the bank, you, you, you open an account and you make deposits and your balance goes up, right? You make withdrawals and your balance goes down. You can get rich or poor or you can go in the red and the bank will close your account. <laughs> and so it works the same emotionally with our, the people in our lives. There's always a running bank account, and I know this is, might sound like keeping score, but it's not. This is something that just happens. When you're making deposits into people's hearts of love, of care, of connecting with their heart, of blessing them in some way, of being a friend, you know, whatever it may be, when you're making deposits, that relationship is getting richer and richer. Okay? When you're making withdrawals, either by hurting them, betraying them, disappointing them, or breaking promises or ignoring them or whatever it may be, being insensitive to them in any way, you're making withdrawals, withdrawals, withdrawals. And every account, every relationship we have, you're either getting richer or poorer as days go by in, in our relationships, right? And so it's, it's really an easy concept to understand. Um, somebody explained that to me years ago and it absolutely made sense to me and I really understood it. Uh, love makes deposits, okay? Love makes deposit, and then you don't keep score. Just make the deposit, all right? Just make the deposit, and then just be rich. Just have a high balance, that's all right. And that's what God did. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Did everybody appreciate that son? No. Did everybody receive that son? No. Some, some of the people hated him, crucified him, rejected him, and still do. God so loved that he still gave. And then he just, he just poured, into that, poured the deposit into that account and then let people respond as they would. Um, here's an interesting one. John 2, it's verse 23 to 25. Uh, this is, this is uh, in the very early part of Jesus' ministry as he's ministering to people and te you know, teaching and speaking to people. And well, let's read it first. It says, when, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. They're seeing people get healed. They're seeing some kinds of miracles happening. And they say, wow, we believe in him. And at this point, how deep is that faith? P pretty shallow, right? It really, and, and that's the whole point he's going to make here. This, is a, this faith is shallow, and Jesus isn't calling this success yet. <laughs> not at all. Go ahead. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Read 25 and then come back. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. What? Yeah. If you could jump back to verse 24, uh, it says, Jesus did not commit himself to them. And, uh, and, and I think another translation of that in some versions is Jesus, Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. Right? Uh, because he knew them. What does that mean? He knows how shallow this is. He knows how shallow their, their belief is at this point. He knows how shallow this relationship is. Uh, there's not much to it. You blow away in, you know, in a heartbeat. And uh, so what's the point of this? Jesus is out. He's proactively loving people, right? He's proactively ministering to them. Uh, and uh, he knows that they're not capable at this point of loving him back the way he's loving them. There's my point. He's, Jesus is very capable of loving them. And you know, when he says he didn't commit himself to them, it doesn't mean he's not committing to people. He came to commit himself to us. He came to make a commitment and a covenant, right, and a promise that he would keep forever. But it means at this point, he's keeping kind of a distance. At this point, he's not just opening himself up to all these people because these people are very capable of turning on him still very easily. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm getting across what I'm trying to get across, but I'm, I'm going to work on it, and I think you'll get it. <laughs> so, uh, if you have a baby and you love the baby, is that baby capable of loving you back the way you love them? 
No, of course not. <laughs> they're, they're just not at that level. They don't have that capability, right? If they give you a smile and a coup, you're like, ah, yay, right? I know that. I got a baby granddaughter, right? And, uh, you know, but are they capable of loving you back? Absolutely not. Not, not, not the way you're loving them. And, and when you're loving somebody who's broken, you, you know, you find somebody who's broken and God says, pour into this person. Are they capable of loving you back the way, maybe the way you're loving them? Maybe not. Maybe not. So if you're looking to that person to be able to love you back and keep score, you're setting yourself up for misery, aren't you? <laughs> so what's what Jesus is saying right now? I acknowledge that you people are very broken here and very shallow right now, and, and you're not capable of, of understanding or loving me back the way ultimately we're going for. And some of you, a few years down the road, some of you are going to really love me, and it's going to get deeper and deeper. But right now it's shallow, and I know that, and that's okay. <laughs> right? And so here's my, th- my point again, is sometimes when you're loving people, you just recognize that they're at a place where they're not really capable of loving in a healthy way yet. Does that mean throw them out? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It just means have your eyes open and love the way God loves. Amen? Proactively (laughs) to transform them. On the other hand, um, love, and I just want to throw this in here. I don't know if it fits here exactly. Um, Love does not enable bad behavior. Um, you know what I mean by that? You know the word enabling? Yeah. Enabling is kind of a psychology or counseling word that means you, enabling means you allow somebody to treat you badly and you just keep letting it happen. and You don't stop it really because I don't know why, because I feel guilty because I, I, I didn't, you know, make your life wonderful in the past. I don't know why, but I'm going to keep letting you treat me badly. That's called enabling. Or somebody who just won't take responsibility for their life, right? I go out and I blew all my money. Can you help me pay my bills? Oh, yes. Okay, sure. I'll write you a check. Oh, I blew all my money again. And now I owe my electric bill. Can you help me? Okay. That's called enabling. Love doesn't enable. Love says, no, actually, you're just going to have your electricity turned off this month. I'm really sorry about that. I love you, though. <laughs> you know, you should learn not to blow all your money. <laughs> you know, that's, um, love doesn't let people, love is not a doormat. Love doesn't let, let people, you know, hurt you uh, over and over, mistreat you consistently. Love doesn't allow that. Jesus never allowed that. You won't find a place in the scripture where Jesus just allowed people to treat him bad or disrespect him until the moment of the cross. Then he took it all, right? But before that, he just didn't allow people to, you know, I mean, the Pharisees would start to give him a hard time, and he'd, he'd tell them, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah, Jesus wasn't insecure. He didn't let people mistreat him. He had nothing, none of that going on. But he also knows when people are broken and shallow, you don't open up too much to them yet. Can I say that again? When people are broken and shallow, you don't, you, don't allow, you don't give them too much opportunity to destroy you because they're capable of it. You love with wisdom, right? And you use a little bit of tough love, too. Love doesn't enable people to, to do wrong and, and treat you wrong. Uh, but love does recognize when people are broken what they're capable of, and you do still love them proactively, just more carefully. Did I say that so it gets across? Oh, cool. Okay. All right. That's awesome. If I communicated that one concept, that's really, that's, that's good. Um, it's a tough one to get across sometimes. Uh, what else does love look like? Uh, how about James 5.16? Uh, love uh, also looks like trying to heal a broken connection. If, if love is about pursuing a heart-to-heart connection, but, but heart connections get broken and damaged, don't they? All the time, all the time. We get, we get broken connections, we get uh, uh, hurts and offenses, and love always looks like trying to heal uh, and restore a broken relationship when it's possible. So James uh, 5.16 says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And uh, my understanding of this verse, this is not talking about like going to confession and saying, oh, forgive me, you know, because I have sinned. That's not what this is talking about at all. This is talking about interpersonal relationships interpersonal. And so if uh, we're in a relationship and I did you wrong somehow, I've hurt you, I've treated you wrong, and that connection is damaged, the connection is maybe broken, (laughs) you know, the connection is really in bad shape, um, hanging by a thread, (laughs) then confess your trespasses to one another really is talking about go to a person that you've hurt in some way and say, I am really sorry. 
I acknowledge that I hurt you. I'm admitting it. I see it. And I and and, and when when you do this, this is called uh, well, well, it's called healing a broken relationship, or it's called making amends, or different things. But but it's not just saying I'm sorry. Saying I'm sorry is actually sometimes often too shallow. It's often not enough. I'm sorry. Okay, that makes it this much better. Not much more than that, but okay, nice try. <laughs> right? Right? I'm sorry is not really strong enough most of the time. What really is strong enough most of the time is to say, wow, I'm understanding that what I did really hurt you. And that, that I'm really sorry for. That I really regret. And can you forgive me? And can I try to make it better? Yeah. Most of the time, most people would say, Okay, thank you, right? How about when you have two people who keep hurting each other? Does that ever happen? You get in a relationship and you don't remember who hurt who first, but, but, but by the time comes months later, years later, you both, you know, whether it's a marriage or a friendship or whatever, like you just, that person's just toxic and dangerous and, you know, and you just keep, you've hurt each other so much and, you know, there's so much distrust and whatever built up, right? And uh, the solution to that is I still believe with all my heart the solution is for one of those two people to take the lead and it doesn't matter who. One person take the lead and, and come and say, you know what, let's talk. I'm really sorry for the ways I've hurt you. And you don't point out what, anything they've done wrong at that point. Leave it, don't mention it, don't bring it up, don't even go there, right? It, that's not even what I'm here for. You know, if you've done a thousand things to hurt me in the past several years, whatever, we're not even talking about worth that right now. What we're talking about is how, what I've done wrong, how I've hurt you. And I want to acknowledge that. I want to be really, you know, really face that. And I want to tell you that I know I've done that. And, and I'm really sorry I hurt you. And I want, I want you to forgive me if you can. And I want to repair it if I can. And when you do that without addressing their issues at all, right, that, they, that takes humility and that's love. That's what love looks like, right? And that, that brings the opportunity for restoration and repair in an amazing way. It's not a guarantee, but it's really powerful, and it often or usually will work, right? We'll usually start to bring some restoration. Love looks like proactively, purposely trying to repair a broken connection, trying to heal that. Um, also, Matthew 5, 23 and 24 Jesus uh, addressed it here this way and said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you or your wife or your husband or your child or your parent or your friend or your neighbor, go ahead. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, friend, husband, wife, child, parent, cousin, neighbor, and then come and offer your gift. Uh, this is called making amends again. This is called right, going to somebody and saying, wow, I, it's not talking about what I have against you. This one's talking about what you, what you have against me, right? If you, I recognize somebody's got something against me uh, with, with good reason. I've done them wrong somehow. I've, I've genuinely done them wrong. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter if we've both hurt each other. That's not the point right now. The point is what have I done wrong to cause damage? And if I recognize that I've done wrong, I'm, Jesus said, just stop right there. Don't, get all, don't bring your gift to the altar. Don't, don't go ahead and be all religious. Put everything on hold. Go and fix that relationship first. <laughs> That's what God really wants. Go and restore that broken connection. <laughs> go and try and heal it if you can. Powerful stuff. And uh, also, but then, uh, Luke 23, 33 and 34. Love also does forgive, doesn't it? We see that picture, the greatest picture ever. Uh, in Luke 23, the cross, when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And verse 34, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. The greatest picture ever, Jesus there being actively murdered, really, <laughs> for his part of God's plan. And he hangs there and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so love does forgive. But I often talk about forgiveness. It's a big theme of mine, and I know how powerful it is. But I also know that that must be balanced by the realization that if I've hurt somebody, right, um, 
I got I got to fix that, don't I? I got to acknowledge that. And uh, <laughs> I mean, have you ever had somebody? <laughs> you ever had somebody that they kind of did you wrong? I mean, they they really did you wrong. They hurt you somehow. And then they come to you and say, you know what? God's been speaking to me about our relationship, and I just want to let you know that I forgive you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you ever had that happen? <laughs> I know it, it does happen, right? And they, like, totally have done you wrong, and they come, God just told me I forgive you. You know, so we're all good now, right? No. <laughs> like, no, not at all, <laughs> right? You forgive me? Thanks. Great. <laughs> One of the most powerful things we can do is take ownership of our own behavior, right? And our own, when I've hurt somebody, that's, it's the most, it, it takes a measure of humility uh, that a, a lot of people just, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. And also, if you do that, if you take that step and uh, make amends to somebody and confess, and confess that, um, it transforms you. It, it absolutely transforms you into a better person than you were five minutes before. It really, really does. There's something qualitatively that happens in your heart through that process of humbling yourself and and going for a healing of a relationship, even without pointing out the other person's faults at all. There's something about that that will transform you into a better person in just minutes. (laughs) It's It's a powerful, powerful thing. But on the other hand, love does forgive, right? So when somebody has hurt me, disappointed me, done me wrong, Jesus modeled it for us. I forgive. I forgive. Right? I forgive. Does that mean, does, does forgiving mean turning yourself into a doormat? No, I think we already covered that one, right? If somebody's still, they're, they're at a place where they're, I forgive you, but you're not really capable of having a good relationship with me right now. Yeah, am I going to be your doormat? No. No, we're not going to do that. Am I going to enable you to continue hurting me? No, we're not going to do that either. But uh, I will forgive you. Yeah, and then as you become capable of having a better relationship, then we'll go for it. All right? And I'll still love you, but I'm not going to put myself in a position to be hurt over and over and over. Okay. All right. Um, what else? First uh, Thessalonians 5.13. Something else, what does love look like? Uh, look, love looks like showing honor and value. Uh, so it says here, uh, to, Paul wrote that we should esteem, he's talking about uh, leaders in the body of Christ, uh, esteem them very highly in love, in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. And I, I just pulled that verse out because it uses these phrases, and it's a principle that it applies across the board. Uh, it mentions love and it mentions esteem. When we esteem people, it means we value them. It means we treat them with value and honor and respect, right? And that's an expression of love. That's what love looks like. So what would be the opposite of that? The opposite of esteeming is belittling, right? You're not important. You don't mean anything. You're an idiot. I I have no, I'm not going to treat you good. I'm not going to acknowledge you in any way. Uh, You don't matter. You're not important. Uh, That's the opposite of love. Love esteems people, values people, notices people, cares for people. Uh, and then First uh, Peter four eight. Also in the theme of of love, uh, honors. This one's really interesting. It says, "Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins." What does that one mean? What does love look like? Love looks like covering sins. Yes, it does. Bible says so right there. What does that mean? Love does not look like exposing people and shaming them. Right? It doesn't look like telling everybody, right? you know what so-and-so said to me? Right? You, know, you know what so-and-so is doing right now? Right? It doesn't look like exposing people, shaming people. That's, not, that's the opposite of love. If, somebody's, if somebody, even somebody's done you wrong, it doesn't mean tell everybody you know. It means don't dishonor them. Maybe you need to talk to them face-to-face. Maybe you need to deal with it. Maybe you just need to ignore it. I don't know. It depends on the situation. But what it does not look like is telling everybody. Love honors people. Love protects people. You know, pray for my husband. I want everybody to pray for my husband because he has this problem. Oh, great. Now everybody knows. <laughs> is that what love looks like? No, not at all. It doesn't. No. Uh, so love covers sins. Love actually for out of, out of good motives conceals a certain amount of things right in the in the interest of honor uh, 
Is there a time to expose things? Yes, there is. Somebody's abusing you, you know, physically abusing you. Open up, tell somebody now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There, there's, there's, there's different principles, you know, involved here. But a lot of things, love looks like covering sins for somebody's honor, for somebody's protection. Because uh, once you take that away from them, you've made a huge, huge withdrawal in the emotional bank account, huh? All right, everybody knows my issue now. So, um, what else? Uh, John fourteen fifteen. Jesus said this also uh, in uh, this conversation before he goes to the cross, conversation with his disciples. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's appropriate for him because he's God, right? <laughs> he's God incarnate. He's the Lord of the church, and he's going to give us some commandments. And if you actually kind of just read those chapters there, he actually gives us two commandments. Believe in me and love one another. That's really what that boils down to, right? But he also gives us some other uh, you know, he gives us a great commission, you know, share the gospel with people. He gives us, you know, feed my sheep and make disciples. And he gives us some other, th- other things, you know, um, some, he, ge- he gives us, he tells us some other stuff to do. And here's my point of this. Uh, how, can I, how can we translate that to other relationships with our peers and our equals? Here's what this means, is if something's important to somebody and, it's, and you're in a relationship with them and it's just, they said, this is important to me, honor it. That's what love looks like, right? Honor it. <laughs> it's important to me. Okay. You know, what, what, is, what does that look like? It's important to me that the house is clean. It's important to me. It matters. Okay, let's do that. It's important to me. You know, what else? Somebody's, I, I, I'll just make up stuff. You know, husband likes to go fishing, and he's got a big dead trout on the wall on a piece of wood, stuffed and mounted, right? And wife hates it. <laughs> right? My husband has a dead fish on the wall. What an idiot. Everybody who comes into the house gets to hear about how my husband has a stupid dead fish on the wall and I can't stand it up there. But someday if I tell everybody, he'll take it down. Is that what love looks like? No, he's probably proud of that fish. Love looks like, hey, look at that fish that yeah, he caught. It's, it was a great story and he's so proud of that thing. Yeah, isn't that awesome? That's what love looks like. If it's important to the person I love, honor it, right? Yeah, <laughs> just making up a, just making up a, <laughs> an example out of the, <laughs> did I, uh, does somebody have a fish on the wall? Is that actually a thing? <laughs> oh, <laughs> still not going to, <laughs> 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 uh, finally, <laughs> oh, let's see. Which one? Revelation 3.19. <laughs> I'll close it with this. I, have, I actually have like three verses that would talk about this, but we're good. We've... So Jesus actually said this to the, to the uh, seven churches uh, in, in his Revelation, the book of Revelation, message through the Apostle John. And uh, in, the, in those letters, Jesus actually corrected some things to those churches. He addressed some things pretty, pretty straight on, didn't he? I mean, if you read those letters, like, whoa, boom, you know? And, and here's the point. Is that love? Actually, yes, it is. Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And, and what does love look like? Um, love looks like confrontation sometimes. If it matters... And it's important, and it's, it's behavior that's doing damage, it's behavior that's wrong, it's behavior that's really breaking a connection, damaging a relationship, and it matters. Love looks like confrontation. Right? If it's stuff that doesn't matter that much, let it go, forgive, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, but, but love sometimes looks like confrontation because something really needs to be addressed, and it matters. But what if it doesn't work? You still did right. You still did right by dealing with it, right? Uh, let's see. I guess that's probably that's probably good there. Does that help? Anything? Yeah, I'm trying to. Because um, I was really it just uh, earlier today, yeah, thinking about you know that whole idea of uh, discipleship again. What did discipleship look like for Jesus? He loved them. He loved them till the end. I thought, that's great. We could all go, yay, amen. But what does it look like? You know, what does it actually look like on a day-to-day basis? And I think, I think that is somewhat helpful there. Uh, because uh, we want to be experts at love, I think. 
right? As, yeah, as disciples of the Lord. He said, by, by your love, they will know you. <laughs> so we need to know what love looks like. All right, let's pray. Can we stand together? And... Hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah, Holy Spirit, come. Welcome. Holy Spirit, move on our hearts. Again, Lord, we position ourselves right now for you to touch us, speak to us, speak into our heart. Fill us with your presence, God. And we welcome that you are discipling us, God. You are loving us, transforming us, making us amazing. You are proactively, with a goal-oriented purposefulness, God. You are, you are transforming us. We say yes to that. We give ourselves to you, to your love, and to this process, God. We also take this process into our relationships and our families and our marriages and our children or our grandchildren, our friendships, God. What does love look like? whisper a prayer to him. Teach me to love Jesus the way you love, the way you love us, the way you loved your disciples, the way you love us now. Teach us to love the same. And as you fill us with your love, God, yeah, show me how to pour that love onto other people, especially the people closest to me first. And ask the Lord a question in uh, these moments. Just ask him maybe which one of those things we talked about tonight, what love looks like. Which one of those things does he want you to really get a hold on right now? And maybe there's a person in your life or several people in your life that he wants you to love more proactively, to love more purposefully. Maybe you've come to a place of truce with somebody and just, you have your wall half up, and they have their wall half up, and you, you still get along, but, but God says, no, take your wall down and learn how to really love. Heal, find something that, if there's a disconnection from the past, find it, heal it. Or, if maybe that's not the issue, it's just, you're just in routine, search them out the way God searched us out. Search them out, pursue them, pursue a deeper connection with their heart. ask God, which one of those principles, what love looks like, which one do you, God, do you really want me to, to learn about and, and step into like right now? Holy Spirit, speak to people, show them, give them breakthrough, breakthrough into loving more proactively, loving more powerfully. And loving more wisely. Breathe on us. Holy Spirit, breathe on us or more transforming us. Teach us, lead us into all truth. If he's, if he's impressed on you something that a way that he wants you to really learn to love more proactively and maybe even highlighted a person or a, several people to you of how to do that or who to aim that at just, just say yes yes God it doesn't mean you're promising to get it perfect what it means is you're just saying yes to the process yes God make that change in me I want that 
I, I say yes to that. Help me to do that. Help me to learn and, and practice that. To see yourself doing that. To see yourself growing and loving more, more proactively, more purposefully, more wisely. Thank you, Lord. You're turning people into radical experts in the love of God. Amen, amen.